Arson is the deliberate and malicious act of setting fire to a person's property. Motivations for committing arson can be broken up into six main categories. The categories are as follows. Vandalism, psychological stimulation, monetary gains, revenge, crime concealment, and extremism. In today's video, we will look at Stanley Ford, a man who would set fire to two of his neighbor's homes, leading to the death of nine people. Neighbors' testimonies show signs of Stanley acting on two of the six motive categories, psychological stimulation and revenge. The psychological stimulation that he received from committing the crimes could have been used to satisfy his heroic desires, since he could have viewed his actions as helping his neighborhood, as we will see. His actions could have also been driven by revenge, since we will hear neighbors allege that Stanley expressed that people deserve to be punished after they previously wronged him. Take note that Stanley's motives are gathered from neighbors in the community because Stanley never confessed to the crimes. When Stanley Ford moved into his current neighborhood, he told one of his neighbors that he believed he was meant to live there. Stanley expressed that he believed to be an angel of God and was placed there to protect them. This led Stanley Ford to focus on his neighbor's personal activities that may have been taking place in their homes. If he saw something he disagreed with or believed it was affecting him negatively, then he was going to deal with it as he saw fit. The belief that he was an angel of God in this neighborhood is a dangerous God complex. Stanley hid behind this excuse as a way to justify his extreme actions. He saw himself as a greater being that could do no wrong in the eyes of God, as if God gave him permission to kill other humans due to their different lifestyles. Stanley Ford was charged with setting three fires over two years, two house fires and one car fire. Between the two house fires, he killed nine people and a dog. The first house fire was in 2016. This resulted in the death of Lindell Lewis and his girlfriend, Gloria Jean Hart. During this time, they had a tenant that was living in the basement that luckily managed to escape the fire. Throughout this video, we will hear from neighbors of the victims about their experience in relation to the crimes, starting with the first fire in 2016. For simplicity, we will assign numbers to identify the neighbors. We will hear neighbor one discuss the arguing he heard in the neighborhood between Lindell and Stanley Ford that led to the 2016 fire. This arguing led neighbor one to angle his exterior security cameras toward Lindell's house because he felt uneasy about the situation. Neighbor one recounted the moment he realized Lindell's house was on fire. He wanted to go help him, but claims the fire was too extensive. This led the neighbor to retreat to his basement and watch the house from his cameras he had mounted on the exterior of his house. Before we get too far into this video, fun fact. If you've seen the Erica Stefanko video on this channel, you just might recognize the prosecutor in this trial. Who was he bickering and arguing? It was Stan and Lewis, Mr. Lewis. Linda. Linda. Okay. So Linda was arguing with Stan, and so you put your camera on your porch so it could get a vantage point of Lindell's house. Because you didn't want to get hurt or anything. Right. The night that Lindell's house caught on fire, tell the, tell the jury how you found out about it. Well, uh, it's, it's a flash of light, and I went outside to check. And I, and I came back and told my wife, I said, call the fire department. I said, Lindell, the house is on fire. Were you awake or were you asleep when? when uh, no, I was watching TV upstairs in my bedroom. What drew your attention? To I've been going there sick and I'm saving, but it was too dark, too bad. It, some, some blew up like a gallon jug. Boom! I went back in my house and told my wife. I said, I'm going downstairs and watch the camera. When you, what drew your attention to the fire at first was, you said it was the light, but was there anything else that made you, that drew your attention across the street? Well, after the other fire, the fire truck that came. Okay. That's really got my attention. We will now hear from neighbor two, and the moment she realized what was going on. 
Her daughter woke her up and thought their house was on fire, since all she saw outside of her window was red. My daughter came into my room screaming, my blinds was red, the house is on fire. And she ran down the steps with her cell phone and I came behind her as fast as I could and we got out there. She was dialing 911, but the front of the house was engulfed in flames. She said that she heard something pop and I think it was the electrical, um, something on the electrical pole that woke her up. But she noticed that her blinds were red and so she looked out and that's when she saw the fire. Lindell's tenant claimed to have had altercations with Stanley and that Stanley also had arguments with Gloria, Lindell's girlfriend. Stanley viewed Lindell's lifestyle as different than his own and disapproved of it. Neighbor 2 recounted her perception of what the environment was like at Lindell's house. Lindell's house was a sort of halfway house for homeless people. There have been claims of drug use, partying, and prostitution in the house. Well, he had a lot of people um, that's, you know, always on the porch. Um, they, you know, some of them I know were homeless because I had seen them um, begging, you know, with the signs at the expressway exit. I seen a couple of them do that. And uh, one of the people that I had seen over there before came to our church and our church helped her and bought her clothes and, you know, toiletries and stuff and tried to get her, help her to get straight now. The second fire was in the beginning of 2017. This was the car fire that thankfully did not harm anyone. Devin Taylor was a son of a neighbor who we will refer to as neighbor three. She heard her son, Devin, arguing with Stanley about two days prior to the car being set on fire. We will hear neighbor three recount the moment she realized her truck was on fire and what she saw. I was woke up in the middle of the night. It was around two o'clock in the middle of the night. Um, someone was, the neighbors upstairs were screaming, my truck was on fire. And I came running outside and my truck was on, on fire. Okay, so the neighbors woke you up. Mm -hmm. Did your other family members also wake up? My kids, no, the kids didn't. Okay. And you said you woke up and you went out to the driveway and your truck was on fire? Yes. You um, had what type of truck? It was a Dodge Durango. Did you call 911 at that point? No, the fire department was already there. That's my Durango after it was set on fire. Okay. So it was set on fire in the back area? There was a wash rag stuck in the um, gas tank. When you got out there, what did you first thing you saw when you came outside? The, the truck was on fire. Like the fire department was busting out the um, driver's side window to be able to get the truck open. Okay. While neighbor three could not be 100% sure who committed the crime, she speculated that it could have been Stanley Ford since he verbally threatened her son. Stanley said he would body him, which is slang for beating him up or even murdering him. Did you know, um, uh, how or even did you know how the truck was set on fire at that point on that night no but i had an idea okay and what was the idea that you had that because my son had had some issues and i knew that there prior to there was another house set on fire up the street and my son had had some issues with the neighbor and I, he kind of let me know that he was not planning and so i kind of assumed that it was him okay and uh, did you have any idea that it I mean, did you know for sure at that point, or did you have other potential per people that may have did this to you? I didn't have any enemies. I didn't, anybody else that I would have thought would have done that. And um, how did you become aware of these issues? The neighbor came to my door, letting me know that my son was walking through his yard and he was upset about it. It wasn't his yard, I believe it was his mother's yard. And he was upset about it and he just wanted my son to stop doing it. Okay, he was upset about it? Mm -hmm. How do you know that that neighbor was upset about it? Uh, he was yelling. He, him and my son had, had verbal confrontations a couple times and we, me and my husband actually heard him and my son arguing at one point where the neighbor, he was telling my, my son that he would body him. He would what? That he would body him. Okay, and you observed this uh, argument? Yes, I, I contacted the police department after I had found out that Mr. Ford had been arrested. 
I contacted the police department and let them know that I thought that it was that my truck being set on fire was in relation to the house fires. The third fire was a few months later. This house fire had seven people residing inside at the time. There were two parents and five of their children, ranging from ages 1 to 14 years old. The fires were set in trash cans in front of the house and flowed through the porch. The house was engulfed in flames and killed the whole family. The teen was found on the staircase. The mother, baby, and dog were found deceased in a room together, and the father was found lying on top of his other children trying to protect them. According to another neighbor, Stanley had confided in her about his concerns regarding one of the children in the house. Stanley allegedly said that one of the children was breaking car mirrors in the neighborhood. Neighbor 2 recounted her experience when she realized another house was on fire. This time the house was further down the street. Again, uh, my daughter uh, came into my room and it was at dawn and she was in my she said, I think we have a fire on our street. And I went over to the side of my bedroom window that faces in that direction. And I saw two um, fire trucks outside and one guy that seemed to be um, spraying the house down, but I did not see it engulfed in flames or anything like that. Yeah, so I said, well, I didn't see any ambulances out there or anything like that. I said, probably everybody is okay. And um, she went back into her room and I tried to go back to bed, but maybe about a half hour later, my phone started ringing. People were calling to ask me if I was okay. The next day or so, neighbor two heard helicopters outside of her house. She acknowledged that this was not necessarily uncommon for her area, but after it persisted, she went outside to see what was happening. When she went outside, she saw Stanley Ford standing outside of her driveway. Neighbor 2 recounted what happened that day and her interaction with Stanley. It was after we found out that all the people had died in that fire. And uh, I had gotten sick, actually. I was in my bed. Um, I had a slight fever. I knew I did, and I, I just didn't feel good. But what did you I, notice going on outside? Well, I kept hearing helicopters roaring in the sky, which is not unusual. Usually, if you hear a helicopter, it's passing through on its way to one of the hospitals. But this day, the noise just kept going and going and going. So I got up and threw something on to go outside to see what was going on. What did you see when you went outside? Every news truck that, that, you know, all the local news, Channel 3, Channel 5, Channel 8, Channel 19, uh, investigator cars, police cars, and all up and down Fulton Street had cars, and it looked like going down Hillcrest had <coughs> cars, and um, a lot of people outside. You see police officers? Yes. At some point, did you see uh, the defendant, Stanley Ford? Yes, I saw Stanley was standing at the end of my driveway when I came out of my house. Can you point on your map where, you, where he was standing? Okay. Who was he standing there with? A group of people. I assume some of them may have been relatives, or, but I really didn't know any of them. Did he say anything to you? I said something to him. What did you say to him? I said, what's going on out here? What did he say? He said, he said something to the effect, um, they think I had something to do with this fire down the street. I don't know anything about those people. Okay. And did he say anything about a camera being on his house? Well, I, when he said that, I asked him, well, why did they think that? And he told me that they thought that because the neighbor had a camera on that saw him going into the house around 2.30 in the morning. He said, I can go in my house whenever I get ready. Something to that effect. If you have never been in a fire, you may be wondering how the nine victims died in the fire and why they weren't able to run out of their homes. When a fire begins, especially outside of the house, 
there is a lot of smoke created due to all the air feeding the fire. Smoke creates carbon monoxide, and this gas becomes trapped in the house. Carbon monoxide is invisible, odorless, and extremely toxic. The fire started while they were sleeping, so during this time, they were breathing in carbon monoxide. Then, as they frantically rushed around the house, they were breathing heavily, taking even more in. Carbon monoxide can make someone lose the capacity to think clearly and render them unconscious. An extremely elevated level can kill a person in as little as five minutes. This toxic exposure mixed with the thick smoke in the house, which limited visibility, is a recipe for disaster. After the fires, the people in the neighborhood were casually questioned. Once the investigation was underway and they knew that it was not an accidental fire, they obtained the video footage from the security cameras on the homes in the neighborhood. Knowing that Stanley owned two homes and seeing a person on the footage going in and out of those two homes that was also shown lighting the house on fire led him to be a suspect. However, he wasn't the only suspect. At one point in the investigation, there was another suspect, the ex-husband of the second house fire victim. He had spent 12 years in jail for attempting to set his ex-wife on fire and confessed to the fire in 2017. The details of his confession did not align with the evidence, so this individual was cleared. A false confession in this case wouldn't be abnormal. This individual didn't get to carry out his attempted murder on his ex-wife, and now she was burned in a house fire. He was vicariously living through the person that committed the crime. They then focused their attention on Stanley. We will hear the recording of an investigator questioning Stanley played in court. This was the first time they interviewed Stanley. The goal of this initial questioning was to get Stanley to agree to go down to the station to review evidence they had. The investigators were trying to set up a time for this to happen. Note that in this initial questioning, Stanley is calm and lighthearted, but dismissive when asked directly to agree to a time. Seriously, man, that is just crazy up here now. Yeah, why did that try to get her house at 4 a.m. in the morning? What is that a problem coming down or, you know? Oh, okay. All right. All right. It's kind of hard because, uh, you know, all my family, they got kids. And, you know, I continue my life. I got kids. And I got to go to school. She got to work. Okay. Okay. I guess what's, what's the best time when you can stop down and know that you can make arrangements? I don't even know. I, I think so. Yeah. It is how schedule. It's crazy, man. We, you know, Kids, we take one dance. Uh, okay. We stay pretty busy with the kids. If you were to do like regular with you, we only need about less than an hour. We got coffee room, we got chips and apple and water and pot. I mean, well, I mean, what it, I mean, what's going on downtown? It, it's easier for us to talk to our, our paperwork and stuff. So, like I say, we want to shoot some photos. Oh, photos. Uh, As the investigators promised, they went back to Stanley's house about an hour later. It was right before midnight, and once again, the goal was to get Stanley to agree to a meeting time at the station. At this point, Stanley is aware that they are honing in on him, and he becomes more argumentative. Stanley tries to come up with every excuse as to why he does not have time. He will also try to redirect the investigator's attention away from him by asking if they investigated others in the neighborhood. The next morning, the investigators went to Stanley's house with a search warrant. So what's a good time to check back in the morning? Okay. So what time? So I'll, I'll be. Uh, I don't have time to give you a call. I'll be. I'll try to give you a call. How about I just call? I'll call you in the morning. Uh, we actually have our uh, another investigator here with us as well. Okay, that's fine. 
Yeah, yeah it's not like it's a simple car to break in. It's very serious. Yeah, but, you know, you know, you know, you got a gangster for a week, like, you know, that's how I'm a gangster. Right, right. Okay, well, you, you say you're going to call. I would have to that. Well, I said I was coming back. Everybody got to get up and go to work, uh, all that stuff, man. Kids got to go to school. Okay. What time does school start tomorrow morning? Well, what have to be there at 8. I'm going to be at 8.25. Okay. All right. So around 9 o'clock? Uh, okay. okay. What, what's wrong with that time? Kind of I understand that, but I have a light too. Yeah, listen, I'm not pressing you guys already. Me up. But I mean, everybody knows something. You actually called 911. Yeah, we did. And right. They were right, and we talked to them also. We can't, we can't let this go, so we uh, we appreciate it. I thought I'd come, I'd come back out and talk to you. Oh, no. And see if you had a chance to talk with your wife. Like we said, you didn't get a chance to talk to her. I did. I did. We could have been down and back by now. Yeah, but she, she don't, she don't, she, she, I'm gonna tell you what she said. She don't want to go down there and that's be, and that's, and that's too separated. She disagreed with that. She can come, she can come with you. No, uh, but she told me you have to be separated. That's how y'all conduct business. Yeah. She can come with you, but you have, there's separate rooms that we have. We've been people yeah, you know, individually, she so. She disagreed with that part. That's the part okay. she, she disagreed with. All right, well, we'll be in touch, okay? All right. The next morning, the investigators went to Stanley's house with a search warrant. Since they could not get Stanley to agree on a time to go into the station, they were looking for another interview with him. This is now the third interview the investigators have conducted with Stanley. He believes that a target has been put on his back because his wife called 911 and reported the fire. Your wife called 911 and appreciate that. I'm sure, you know, you know, you appreciate, you know, I mean, I have a regret and I don't have a regret. Oh, you know, right. so that, whoa, well, because I'm getting a target now. I understand that, and that's a, a duty of a citizen, you know, to call. I appreciate that. I mean, that's what right. But it's a civil duty, right? Well, it's it's supposed to be a right. common sense. Yeah. I guess I want to know. Like you said, you she called roughly before three. So I don't know what time she got. She got to the restroom. She saw her. Right. Right. Okay. So yeah. yeah. You said you were what? Sleep. I was sleep. Yeah. Okay. She just she woke up. And she just said she's on fire. You know. And okay. Yeah. Got up and looked. She said, I'm calling 911. I said, go over your hands. You know, and I said, you know, I said, well, you know, they're going to think we suspects. When you looked out the window, what you seen? I just saw flames, man. Okay. That's all I saw. I ain't seen nothing else. Flames, man. Okay. Stanley is directly asked if he knows the family that lived in the house that was set on fire. He claimed that he didn't get to know any of the neighbors and kept to himself. The investigators tried to get Stanley to admit that he watches over his neighbors and takes an interest in what they are doing at their homes. This would help paint a picture of the relationship between Stanley and his neighbors, even if it were only a one-way relationship. Uh, Officer Smith? Okay, you said you know the people at that house and you don't know them? No, I don't know them before. Oh, what was the neighborhood? Like, listen, I'm like this here, man. Uh, I, you know, I learned my lesson trying to be friendly with neighbors, man. You, you can't just do that, so I don't... I don't, I don't try to be friendly with neighbors no more. I'm done with that. They had the neighborhood watch, it was a better neighborhood, the kids was good, but now it can transition to renters and stuff like that. It's kind of, it's bad, man. Right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned some things last night about some bad people at the house, or? Well, to, to, to me, I thought they were well, bad people. Yeah. Good. They, the stuff they was just doing even church in the neighborhood. Like what? Shit, uh, kicking the uh, people who was uh, rear view mirrors, busting them out and stuff like that. That was all that? Adults and kids. Adults and kids. Damn, man. I know we can't have any people in the house. I, I, I tell you, I don't know them, but I tell you what, I keep an eye on I know what's going on in the neighborhood. That's what I do know, yeah. Uh, okay, the word of mouth, that's what they was doing. I never went down there and bought no way. I ain't never did that. Uh, uh, but I'm, I, I don't want to be taken to I don't get in people's business. Okay. You know, I'm not my own business. And I don't let nobody get in my business. Okay. Okay. I don't go to nobody's business. You understand what Your business, you tell somebody that can hurt you. And so let me say this, man. You, you know you know when babies die in the fire, right? Yeah, man. Listen, man, my wife my, my uh, watching it. I'm going to go to church. You know, but... But, but let me tell you something. I didn't do that. I'm not, I'm not saying you did, but... I'm not saying that. I did that. Well, I'm not saying that. I'm asking questions. I'm saying, you know, what I'm saying is you know about some things at the house. That's why I'm asking. I, don't, I didn't know this word of mouth. I don't... That, that's, I didn't see traffic. I don't know that's what... That's the conversation led to discussing the search warrant and flammable things Stanley may have had in his house. 
Stanley will once again try and distance himself from his neighbors and the crime. As far as the house, anything on your house, you see, you saw a search warrant. Right. So you, do you have yes, anything that we need to know about or anything in there that's dangerous, a dangerous warrant? So we don't mm -hmm. I got gas and stuff like that. Like what? What kind of gas? For the, for the lawnmower. And where is it? It's in the basement. Okay. And what kind of container? Uh, gas on the tank. It's a red or red. red yeah. Gas anything else you keep in the house? Like what? Like food, kerosene, or anything like that? Mm -hmm. I, got, I got some, uh, look at turpentine stuff. You got a lot of food or anything like that? I got a lot of food. A lot of food at home. I was say we got a cook, got a grill. I got a grill. Where is it, where is it kept? Uh, it's, in, it's in my mom's garage. Help me out, so. I mean, we know it's just trash, but I... Exactly. I tell you that all the time, man. Yes. If someone like that, that, if someone had did that, it should happen to that person. Oh man, uh, if that's the case, uh, if whoever did it, they need to be punished. Okay, but what's happened to me? Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what what kind of laws there should be applied to that. I don't know the law. I got you, but, but uh, I didn't. Do it. Okay, so you're looking at me like I, I didn't do it. Lastly, the investigators will directly confront Stanley about the footage they found on the cameras. Stanley denied leaving the house during the time in question. As we heard in the first interview, Stanley was calm, and now he is more forceful. He talks over the investigator to try and control the narrative, and not let the investigator draw conclusions that Stanley disagrees with. The jury recommended life without the possibility of parole for Stanley Ford. It could have been due to the lack of DNA evidence that the jury was not comfortable sentencing him to death. Was Stanley filled with anger, power, or both? Thank you for watching and join me next time when we explore the psychological maze of some of the most wicked people.